good to see you here tonight. Be on chapter 16 tonight. It's got quite a long introduction, but I like how it kind of recaps and talks about how important this uh, attribute of God is. It's His holiness, and it's really the basis of where all of the other attributes of God come out of. For this lesson, um, if you wouldn't mind opening to Deuteronomy 7, I got a verse I wanted to use with his uh, introduction before we get into the, the study verses. Um, but he starts out with giving us a, a meaning of uh, holy, what the meaning of holy is. And in this section, that's what the whole theme is, is that God is holy. He says here that the word holy comes from a Hebrew word, kadosh, which means separated, marked off, placed apart, or withdrawn from common use. With regard to God, the word has two important meanings. God is transcendent above his creation and above his creation's corruption. So God being transcendent above his creation says here that the word transcendent comes from the Latin verb transcendere, which is trans, which is over, plus scendere equals to climb, which means to go beyond, rise above, or exceed. That's God's transcendence. That's, that's part of his holiness. But as creator, God is above his creation and totally distinct from every created being. The distinction between God and the rest of his creation is not merely quantitative, meaning the same but greater, but it is qualitative. God is com a completely different being. Regardless of their splendor, all other beings on earth and in heaven are mere creatures. God alone is God, separate, transcendent, and unapproachable. And here's where I wanted to use this verse. Um, if you've got your Bibles open to Deuteronomy 7, it's verse 9. And this verse is one that stuck with me ever since I heard it. It says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And this verse to me just really sums up, uh, you know, if you want to get a good definition of God, and I thought about what uh, he had said here is that this is true, that God is he's separate, transcendent, and unapproachable. But in this verse that I wanted to add to this right there, because it mentions God's unapproachableness, and that's really what his holiness is all about, is that the truth is that God is unapproachable. I and mean, we're, we're not able to approach him. Nothing in his creation is able to approach him. The holy angels are not able to approach him without God allowing that, without God making provision for that, without God... Uh, uh, bringing it about in his will and, and according to his way that any of his creatures could approach him. Even at our very best, you know, especially uh, humans, humans in a, in a fallen condition, we're nowhere close to being able to approach God. And that's what this whole section is about, uh, is, is really his holiness and, and where God is set apart. But it sounds like a, a, a scary thing, and, and his holiness is a, a fearful thing. But ultimately, we'll see that all of God's attributes flow out from his holiness, his love, his mercy, his, his, also the other things, his wrath, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence. All of his attributes flow out of the basis of that he is holy. He's not like anything in creation. He's far above. He transcends everything in creation. He's not like anything that we can compare him to. He's, he exists in a place of unapproachableness. But I wanted to, to make a comment on it. You know, like it says in Deuteronomy 7, he is God, but he's the faithful God. And he keeps his covenants. And that, that to me, when I, when I think about that, and, you know, God being holy, I'm thankful that we do have covenants. We have covenants, as specifically we call it the new covenant, the covenant of grace. And God is faithful in that covenant. And in that covenant of grace, it's, it's the place in which that God has, has made it so that unholy men can be reunited and come into the presence of a holy God. We do that through Jesus Christ. And by faith in him, a man is born again and, and, and able to uh, believe on God. And then be reunited and have peace with God through faith in the work that Christ has done. And then we progress in sanctification. And sanctification is, is what God's ordained for men to progress in. It's a, 
it's an existence where we, we, under the the power and the help of the Holy Spirit, we put off the corruptions of the flesh, that we progress towards holiness. And then one day, uh, you know, God has made it so that through Christ and what he's done for us, we can be with him in his presence, which outside of God's work could be absolutely impossible for something unholy to be in the presence of holiness. So as we continue, uh, as we study about this, there's going to be some times where uh, as we study God's holiness, it really sets him apart, and it really does uh, um, create almost a fearful image sometimes as we see God in his holiness. But that's the whole point. As we see other um, uh, saints, and especially one example in Isaiah 6, we'll see where Isaiah was just crying out, he's coming undone when he saw the holiness of God. But we continue here with our introduction. It says, holiness is the preeminent attribute of God and the greatest truth that we can ever learn about him. Every other divine attribute that we have studied and will study is simply an expression of his holiness in that it demonstrates that he is distinct from his creation and absolutely separate, a completely different being. But the triune nature of God is an expression of his holiness. And then we're asked here a question, is there any created being so incomprehensible, mysterious, or wonderful? And I love that he got our minds thinking about this because that's what God's holiness is going to communicate to us as we look at this, is that he is uh, so distinct and so different from anything in creation that, that we can't point to specific examples. We can't even take even the holiest angels and point to them and say God's like that angel. God is, is far above and, and transcends anything in his creation. A couple of scripture verses, um, if Bull can pull them up on the screen, Isaiah 40 verse 18 says that, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? Another place in the psalm, Psalm 89 verse 6. In Psalm 89 verse 6 it said, For who in the heaven can be compared unto thee, Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? And so these are just some verses here as we uh, think about this. His incomprehensibleness, his mysteriousness, his wonderfulness. As we see in the, the prophets here that... Uh, even they ask the questions, who can be likened unto God? There's none even in the, the, the mighty ones. The, the, there's none among the angels. There's none among the, the heavens that can be compared to him. But even to say, as we continue here, even to say that God is a spirit, as we see in John 4, 24, is to express another aspect of his holiness. And we're said there, is there any creator being so free and unhindered? And there's another part of God's holiness uh, being expressed in his omnipresence is that as a spirit, God's not bound. We've talked about that quite a bit. He's not bound in heavens. He's not bound uh, to the earth. He's not bound in any way. He's a, he's a spirit. He's free to be anywhere and everywhere. This is all part of God's holiness. This is him not being like his creation but being separate and apart from his creation. But God's perfection, his eternal nature, his self-existence, his immutability, his omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience are all expressions of his holiness. Is there any created being so great and worthy of reverence? And the answer is no. There's nothing in all of creation that, that is worthy of worship like God is. There's nothing in all of creation so glorious as God is in his holiness. Another verse that we probably all know very well is uh, Revelation 4.11. And I'll just mention that one as we get to the, the end of the introduction here that said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasures they are and were created. Gives us another picture that we see, and there's another place we'll come back to in the study in Revelation 4 verse 8 that, that tells us more about this scene. But it's, it's all these places in the scripture. It's emphasized more often than anything else in the whole of the scripture is God's holiness. It's the only thing in scripture taken to the, the highest degree that you can put it in Hebrew when God is called thrice holy. It, it's his attribute that, that, that should take the preeminence. Like he's, Mr. Washer's already noted here that it's the preeminent one. It's, it's the above all things else, God's holiness. 
But as we continue our study of the attributes of God, and as we walk before Him, we must keep in mind this one great truth. God is. God is holy. All that He is and does is an expression of His holiness. And so our next section here says, God is transcendent above creation's corruptions. And the holiness of God means that He transcends the moral corruption of His creation and is separated from all that is profane and sinful. God cannot sin, cannot take pleasure in sin, and cannot have fellowship with sin. There's another one of those places where we see God's holiness really showing out and, and, and standing apart from us and putting a, a distance and a gap from anything in creation because anything that is corrupt is, is set apart from Him. That's, that's the whole thing about God's holiness and being set apart is that He's not like the corruptions. He's not like the, the evil things. He's completely, totally separate from, from darkness. He is light. He is life. He is the, the opposite, the... the um, the, the perfections. He's, he's not like the limited things of his creations. But it's just this huge gap and huge separation that God's holiness puts him between him and creation. Now in the scripture we see this emphasized a lot in the Old Testament by the, the curtain or the veil. You know we, we read about that and we rejoice in Matthew 27 when Jesus dies that the temple veil is rent. Opening a place that, that men could go into the holiness, the holy place of God. Only because of what Christ has done. Because the truth is, all them years when that veil hung there separating that holy place, it was a, a constant reminder, a physical barrier to, to always remind men that God is holy. And in there where God dwelt was holy. And no one could just approach any time they wanted to into the holy place. Something had to be done to make it so that men could go to the holy place. So as we continue reading here, it says... It is important, I mean, it is impossible to overemphasize the importance of God's holiness. So said, what we understand about this attribute will influence every aspect of our relationship with God. As the scriptures declare in Psalm, I mean, in Proverb 9:10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You're going to see that theme come up so often, and there's so many verses. There could be a ton more verses even added to this section as we go through it, where God's holiness is talked about, emphasized, and, and brought to the forefront of people's minds in Scripture. It's, a, it's Like he says, it can't be overemphasized, and it's of the preeminent importance that we understand God's holiness. And so as we begin our study here, the first place we'll be turning to will be Exodus 3.14 that we've looked at quite a bit. And we go back to the Exodus account here because it's where God reveals his name. And that's where we start with understanding who God is and where we start with understanding um, you know, his base identity is with his name. And Mr. Washer points out here that in the scriptures, a name has great significance and communicates something about the person who bears it. And it says, what are the names given to God in the following scriptures? And what do they communicate to us? communicate to us about his holiness. And Exodus 3.14 says, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And what we're looking for in our study there is the I am that I am. God, holy and separate, distinct from all other beings and things. And Mr. Washer notes here that there's no adequate illustrations like we've already talked about. There's no examples to communicate who God truly is in creation. Nothing of mirror creation is there, in, is there to illustrate or give an example of God except his perfect son, Jesus Christ. But if we ask another man, I love the illustration he gives here, he says, if we ask another man to describe himself to us, he can point to other human beings and say, I'm like him. Or, you know, a woman could point to another woman and say, I'm like her. You know, we might could find a, a comparable uh, person to look at and point to and say, well, if you want to know me, you can, I'm like them, or I'm, I agree with them, or I would, you know, be like that. But God, when he looks at the earth, or, or even in all of his creation, there's no one single thing to point to. There's no one thing in creation that's merely just a creature that God could point to and say, yeah, I'm like that. 
There's nothing that we could pull up out of creation or, or try to teach men and say, yeah, God's like that, except the one thing, the only thing in all of creation, Christ Jesus. But not even the greatest archangel, Mr. Washer notes here, in heaven is an adequate example. Not even the greatest archangel. It can compare to God's holiness. So while angels are holy, while men can be made holy, God himself alone is holy. And that's what he gets across here with his name, I am that I am. His holiness is at the root and base of this, is that there, there's no description could be given here. When Moses asked, what is his name? What is your name? This is what God told him. This is how he was to, to communicate to the Israelites. The I am has sent me unto you. But this truth helps us to understand the great importance of the revelation of God in Christ. God being holy and being the I am, we, he was so separated that man's so fallen that when God deals with these people here, he, he starts with this name. This is the name. And as that you know, un revelation is unfolded and the prophets come along and, and God does many, many things to let us know him and to see him and, and he works in history and in his creation to, to give us a better understanding of who he is. But ultimately it all comes to uh, a fulfillment in Christ as God takes on flesh and walks among us and demonstrates exactly what he's like. But Jesus is God in the flesh. And the only true image or example of God are who is God himself. And he gives two verses, John 14, 9, is where Jesus and, and Philip had asked him to show him the Father. And, and then uh, Jesus said to him, how long have I been with you? And have you not known me, Philip? And that was, you know, one example of where Jesus was saying that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. Colossians 1, 15 is our great verse we've looked at many times where it says, who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature Christ Jesus so if we want to know who God is and we want to uh, understand more about him we need to study and be serious in our study and our, our, um, our comprehension of the life of Christ because in looking at him and how he lived and how he walked and how he talked and the things that he did that was where God expressed himself in all of his fullness was in Christ it's the only way that men can understand who God is or come to know God is in Christ. And what is beautiful here is Mr. Washer ends this by saying God now answers every question about himself by pointing to his son and declaring, I am like him. And that's what it's just, just a wonderful testimony that we have that, that anytime you want to try to teach somebody about God or you want to, you got a question about God or you wonder how God would think about this or think about that, we can look at Christ. We can point men to Christ because God's given his seal of approval that I'm like him. I thought this was wonderful because we can actually build um, from the scriptures. Um, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is 1 John 5, 8. And it says, There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. And I thought, what a wonderful thing that Mr. Washer's pointed out here, that God in his holiness uh, uh, had, had chosen to, to heal that gap and to, to span that breach that was between God and man. And he gave us Christ. He gave us the, the mediator of the new covenant. He gave us uh, uh, the sin bearer. He gave us Christ Jesus himself in the flesh. And then John points out that there was witnesses bore. And then when Mr. Washer says that God points at his son and declares, I'm like him, that's not just hyperbole. God actually did that on three occasions. And that's what John was pointing out. When he wrote this verse, um, see, we see in uh, Romans 1, 4 that God declared him to be the Son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection. According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection. God pointed and said, that's my son. In the water, John says, and we know the account from Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, there, when Jesus was baptized and taken up out of the water, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God pointing at Christ and saying, I'm like him. And then the blood, like we talked about. When Jesus died there in Matthew 27, the veil of the temple was rent. God given his uh, approval, his, his, his uh, uh, exclamation point on the work of Christ being finished. 
that he tore the veil, signifying and showing that the breach was fixed, the gap was filled in, that the, the, the wound was healed, that Christ had brought reconciliation between a holy God and unholy man through Christ Jesus. John also says in 1 John 5, 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. We have such a wonderful confidence in this. Like Mr. Washer points out here, I don't have to take it on the testimony of a man. I don't have to take this on the testimony of, uh, of my own conscience even. But I can rest assured that God has pointed at Christ and given record that that is his son. And truly, as we see in his life, he was holy. He was distinct. He wasn't like the rest of this creation. When, when a man was to touch another leper, you know, you became unclean. But when Christ touched lepers, he healed them. We saw when men got in the boat and went out into the sea, the waves got up and, and, and terrified them. But when Christ came, he walked on that water and he commanded those seas. He was holy, set apart, different in his life, being the expressed image of God. And so the great I am points at Christ and says, I'm like him. So this witness that God gave, we ought to accept the witness and testimony of God, of his own son. But we'll go to Psalm uh, 111. Psalm 111, as we continue in this first part here. And we're looking at verse 9 in 111. It said, He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. And there we see some things being mentioned again about his covenant, about his name. But what we're looking for in our study, the fill in the blanks there are holy and reverend. Holy and reverend, the scripture says, is his name. His very name, his very identity is holy. And then we mentioned there about his covenant, redemption. Redemption for his people. That's the good news tonight. Not to be missed in that verse, but the holy and reverend is his name. And his name truly is holy and reverend. But there would be nothing but, but, but slavish fear. There would be nothing but a, a fearful looking under condemnation if it weren't not for the redemption that he's brought. If it were not for his covenant and his faithfulness to it. Because he is holy, set apart. But the word here, reverend, the study notes, comes from the Hebrew word yare, which means to fear. It says it can also be translated as awesome. In this context, it denotes that God inspires awe and reverence. A proper understanding of the holiness of God will always result in a profound reverence before God. And he's right in his statement here that, you know, if we take away the, the mercy, if we take away the, the love, if we take away all of that, we, we truly, like he says, we would be left with, if you can imagine having, you know, us as finite as we are and, and to be there before a holy God. There would truly be nothing but fear left. Nothing but a fearful looking. But there are the other attributes of God that we know about that come out of his holiness. But his name even is holy and reverend. So if you'll turn over another book there to Isaiah 57. We'll continue on here. Isaiah 57. And this, is, this verse here is just, just awesome. I've never seen it like I saw it when I read it today. Uh, it just it just really struck out to me, and it's in the midst of a of some verses here that talk about the mercy of God, and uh, it's just a just a great verse because it illustrates God so well in 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 the the loftiness here. But Isaiah fifty seven, verse fifteen, he said, "For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth." Eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart 
of the contrite ones. And man, this verse just really stuck out to me because I can just see a picture of Christ in this. You got both sides of it. You got the high and lofty one. And that's truly where Christ belongs, high and lifted up on that throne, as we'll see later when we get to Isaiah chapter 6. But Isaiah saw him up there, high and exalted on that throne. That's where Christ sits, high and lofty. Look at that. It says, that inhabiteth eternity. That's where he lives. Not in the finite bounds of creation, but in eternity, whose name is holy. Emphasizing that, that, that transcendence, that his, his separatedness, his holy nature. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. That's where Jesus belongs. That's where God lives, and that's where he belongs in his holiness. But then look at the other part of that. There's just such a tenderness there. It, Matthew 11, 28 and 29 is what comes to my mind. You remember when Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that uh, heavy and laden, and, and I'll give you rest. Learn of me, take my yoke upon you, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. And look at the second part of this verse in Isaiah here. With him also, that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You see, the high and exalted one made such a condescension to come down to one who would be of a, a humble or a contrite heart, as it says here. That's a, a broken heart. I mean, what, what, what would the high and lofty one care about a sinner who's down there in creation suffering with a broke heart under the consequences of his own actions. But the high and lofty one stepped down so far because he says the one that inhabits eternity also is with him of a contrite heart. The meek and lowliness you see of the heart, the, the mercy that comes out, the, the love part here. But then also the the, the, not to forget his holiness that God still is the high and lofty one you know sometimes we gotta remember not to forget that yes Jesus was man but he was also God and while we, we look at him as God we don't forget that he was also man and then and, and not to forget that picture that, that perfect image that perfect picture that God has given us to look at Christ the one who can who, who healed the gap, the one who can, who is high and lofty, the one, the righteous one, the holy one, who also can condescend so far to, to even dwell with contrite and humble spirits with the purpose of reviving them. I'm just amazed when I read that, reviving them. The purpose of giving them life when they deserve to suffer and they deserve to, to, to flounder in their own sins and, and all the things that we deserve to have happen to us because of our sin. I saw a person today made a comment on, on Facebook and they were talking about men and how men complain and, and they couldn't understand why any man, man who had life in his lungs, who had breath in his lungs and a beating heart could possibly complain because any one of us that's not suffering in hell right now for our own sins is a monument to God's grace and mercy. And I thought, wow, that just struck me as I was had this verse on my mind too though. It was for our sake that the Holy One came down from so high up to comfort a, a contrite heart. And he's the one himself that even breaks our hearts and brings us to that condition. Because if it were not for his word and, and for the gospel, we would walk around in our pride and arrogance. We'd walk around boasting against God and, and walking around complaining against God. Though we all we have nothing to complain about truthfully because we're, we've all been dealt with far more mercifully than what we deserve. But D... The point here um, says, in the preceding verses, talking about the, the three we just read, Exodus, Psalms, and Isaiah, we see words like holy, reverend, and lofty. We're used to describe God. What do these words communicate to you about the holiness of God? And I think what we need to be understanding at this point when we look at these three words is, in the holiness, we need to think distinct, separate, incomparable. That's the, the ideas we need to be getting when we see holy in reference to God. When we see reverend or reverence towards God, we need to think of awesome or worthy of fear and honor. And when we see lofty, we need to think of far above. Or as the scripture loves to call him in the Old Testament, 
the most high. You can't get any higher. The, the ceiling, the, the most high, the God of heaven.